The Song of Solomon also has some of those same qualities. In fact, I don't know of a Bible which does not have those qualities. There we go. We're going to ask you to bow your head. Brother Reggie Carter is going to order our prayer for us. And we'll get it right to work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this evening that we can come together to study thy word, that we can enjoy the depth of the study, and that we can apply it to our lives and we can become closer drawn to thee through the wisdom of thy word. We're thankful for Jim for his ability to teach the class and the others that we had and we'll have to see you. Be with each of us as we can study thy word and apply it to our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Last week we gave out a little final review on the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, there, so uh, if you would uh, want to hand that back to me at the end of the class tonight, that would be all right for you to do so. It was all right for you to use your uh, notes and books on that test with the exception of the memory verse, which is Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. And of course you want to write that for the memory. If perchance you decide to go ahead and answer the questions on the test without assistance of your notes or Bible, just write the word up there, helpless, okay? I'll give you some extra credit <laughs> considerations for it. Fair enough? So uh, I did it that way, so that's correct. What would you say one of the great lessons we learned out of the book of Ecclesiastes thus far? If any. Without God, there's nothing better to say if it's it nothing. Really. That's the great that's one of the, that may be the great lesson in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you want to boil it down to a sentence or a statement or to a thought in the process, in fact that's summed up in the conclusion. It's the whole duty of man, literally the whole of man. This is what man is all about. It's what Solomon is trying to get over to us in that great lesson. And we'll open up our minds and our hearts, we can receive that and learn from it and make application of it to our life. One thing that I have uh, learned once again, I think, you know, if you look at the life of Solomon, Solomon's noted historically for one or two things, basically two primary issues. We think about qualities of Solomon. What's, what's the two things that come to our mind on top of the class? Wisdom. wisdom. He's known him for wisdom. Did he always display it? No. No. But he did some good writing about it, didn't he? What's the second thing he's noted for? Wise. Huh? Wise. Peter said wives. Wives? Well, that's right. He had a lot of them. Let's add a third thing just to make it expand the list a little bit, okay? What does that mean? Money. 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 He wealthy. In fact, so nobody could out wealth him, nobody could out wife him, and nobody could out wise him. Get right down to it. The process. And then he wrote about the idea that without God, where is wisdom? relationship that man may have with wife or wives in the world. It's vain. In fact, when you get to the book of Psalm of Psalm there, it's really it's impressive the fact of how much emphasis he put upon the relationship of a man and a woman. And so it teaches us some great lessons in that book. And without without God, what about all these wealthy, this all this stuff and money we put together? What's it worth? It's vain too. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity, saith the preacher. I read that somewhere. Maybe you did too if you don't do the chapter 12, okay? Not a part of chapter 11 in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon's getting to the point where he's going to give some good advice, if you will, to kind of sum up with some matters pertaining to the recommendations for a happy life. He talked about in the first part of chapter 11 the idea of benevolence, casting bread upon the water. He talked about the idea of wise man in the earlier part of the chapter. You know, he's, he's, he'll spend his days and his labors to benefit. To have, well, that's a good thing to do, beneficial. And then when he gets down to about verse 9 there, he talks about kind of where we left off last week in the process. He talks about the idea of you. And this will continue on at least through verse 7 and 8 of chapter 12. Rejoice, O young man, in the days of thy what? The days of thy youth. And important for us to know and understand if you have your study questions available, you might have those out. Go well, ahead. If you haven't already, I'm sure you probably already filled those things out a long time ago in the process there. And uh, days of life. I think the word youth there is noted somewhere has been a rather unique word 
read in the Bible as such, and not that the Weemish word used is not there many times, but the word for which this particular word is translated as such. It's unique to that. The days of our youth, you know, let the let your heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Walk in the ways of what? Your heart? And in the sight of thine eyes. What's he say? Walk in the ways of your heart, in the sight of your eyes. But he says you need to know one thing. Here's that one thing you know. What do you need to know when you're walking in the sight of your eyes and no matter things pertaining to your heart? God will judge you. God will judge thee. And all these things God will bring this young man, all of us, if you will, him to judge him. Youth, uh, he describes as being vanity there. How long does youth last? Cut the off. And uh, so, when do we make some of the most critical decisions of our life? When we're young, don't we? We agonize in the process of raising our children. You know, we look at the Bible teaches us to raise them up in the nurture and the happiness of the Lord. We know the decisions they're making in the days of their youth are going to be decisions which will have consequence whatever days God sees that they may have upon this earth and on into eternity. So it's important to do these things. And so therefore, verse 10, remove sorrow from thine heart, put away evil from thy flesh. If you're going to walk the ways of your heart, what are you going to about your heart? Something you need to about. Now something needs to be get to need to be gotten out of your heart. We can say that. what needs to be getting got out of your heart. Evil. Keep your heart with all the light. The evidence. Proverbs 4:23. And he says, "For your childhood and youth are vanity." And he continues on. The chapter breaks not to consequential here. You know, just just keep on until remember now. Talking about youth, remember now you've what the days of you. You create. You create. But these young people, you know, they come along and they're just too young to learn. They're too, too small. They're too, is that the case? When the children begin to learn? Immediately. Immediately. And or before, right? I know one time I read an article about this one lady who was teaching her child calculus before he was born. So that might be stretching just a bit about no child may have grown up and be a mathematical genius. Sir. But they learn everything, you know, the brain is just like a sponge. And what goes in is what's going to be squeezed out in some form or fashion. While the evil days come, he talks about some evil days here now. The evil days are set in contrast to what other days? The youth. So the evil days he's talking about are what? Look out here, we're going to get picky now. Nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in. The evil days are the older days, and such. Not necessarily because of the moral character of them, but just. He talks about the days when you have no pleasure, and he talks about a number of things down through chapter 12 here in the process. And uh, if you got your questions out there, you kind of go down through there. We'll just kind of run down through them together rather quickly, if you will. Some points of this allegory, as it's usually termed in verses 2 through 6 there, as such. And so the inconveniences of old age are called the evil days here in verse 1. I don't know about that word inconveniences, but I know there's a lot of them that are on the way. And as time goes by, so you might think it gets a little, gets to be a little more inconvenient. Well, it's, I guess that's a good way of putting it. And so here it talks about in verse 2, when the sun or the light or the moon or the stars are not, be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain and the pot. What's he talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars there? What's, what's, what happens as the years go by? The eyes begin to get dim, you know. So as far as you look at the eyes there, the sun, is the sun any less brighter today than it was 100 years ago? That's still bright. So we just have a number of years. The days of the keepers of the house shall tremble. Keepers of the house will be the, probably the hands and the arms. I'm not suggesting that every word that we fill in here is going to be the exact, you know, there might be some alternatives to it, but these are some thoughts that are generally thrown along these lines as such. It seem to fit, fit the bill of the process. Talked about the strong men there, uh, bow themselves or bow themselves. What's the strong men? Pillars are marble you legs, you know. And in the old age, they just don't quite work as strong as they once did. You can't jump up in the stairs like you did when you were younger, you know what I mean? Have you ever experienced that? Okay. 
and grinders shall cease because they're few. And that, of course, has been pretty obvious at UT. Those that look out the windows uh, shall be darkened, and so it probably has a reference to your, also your, probably eyes. And, uh, the doors, here's an interesting one in verse 4. The doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinder is low, and he shall rise up in the voice of the bird. Three or four things in that particular word. Talks about the doors. There's a lot of questions about it. Here's one that we're suggesting. I'll put a question mark beside my answer. What answer did you put in yours? Do what? Tell me. Lips? That's what I put on mine because I got it from somebody else. But it makes sense, I guess. The idea seems to be uh, Proverbs, Psalm 441, he said, Set uh, uh, a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, keep the door of my lips. So there's one, one instance at least in the psalm for the word door is used in reference to the mouth or to the lips which come forth from it. So at least it's a suggestion. Anybody have another thought that they'd like to introduce? There. Street uh, thought would be in the mouth, you know, and what comes, through, you know, what passes through there, you know, the, my throat and all such, those things through which uh, the food passes. Sound of grinding in the course, the sound would have to do with what aspect of our being. Now here in a building, grinding noise probably made by what? Chewing. Chewing. Someone said masticating your food and that sort of thing. Um, there uh, shall rise at the voice of a bird. <laughs> you look guilty, brother. <laughs> you know, the bird, you know, anything we get, right? He's easy, easily awake, it seems to be the idea. Sleep lightly. Is the uh, daughters of music brought low? It's an interesting expression here. And what did you put down for that? Anybody? Do what? Hearing gets bad. I couldn't understand. Your hearing gets bad. Hearing gets bad. All right. That's one thought about it. Some suggested that the idea could have to do with the voice that loses its strength. I don't know. That may be. But you know, again, it talks about, you know, seems, seems like it could be either way on the process. And, uh, Daughters and music, you know, that which comes forth does come forth from our voice. That's what it might be a thought. A terrorist shall be in the way. Any of you done any ladder climbing lately? A little bit more reluctant to do so than you once swore in the process? This doesn't seem to be quite a stable. And so, afraid of falling, fear of falling, afraid of falling. The almond tree blossoms there. What verse is that there in the process? Uh, verse 5, almond tree shall flourish. Uh, what happens to the top of your head besides blues? Sometimes it's hair turns what? Turn Why? Maybe, maybe turn loose, turn white, turn gray, turn loose. It's in a turning process. In there, so. Grasshopper shall be a burden. Now, we don't have that on the list there at all. Grasshopper, grasshopper becomes a bird. Little, little things become a big problem. Yeah, little things become big problems, you know. You know. Well, you used to just jump up and grab and go with, and now you grab it and you just, that sticks out it doesn't come up. That 100 pound weighs a whole lot more now than it used to. And uh, so, be a bird. Desire shall fail, you know, you just get to where you don't want to do too much in life in the process there. Lose your strength, and you carry your purpose, that your desire shall fail. Because man goeth to his long home. What? And uh, so man goes to his long home. What's your long home? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one after this one. When, when are you going to quit living in the long home? You're not going to. It's going to be there. Mourners go about the street. That's because of people pass and there's a mortar put the culture of days over. Then verse 6 it talks about the silver cord to be loose, the golden bowl be broken, the pitcher be broken, or the wheel broken it's the system. All of those uh, expressions seem to have to do with basically what event? Yeah. Not the death, life is like the thing. And uh, so those are one of those things, you know that's the way it is. The process. And so Solomon says vanity of vanity said the preacher all this vanity. And here he has something to say about the words, which is written, I think we'll look at it very quickly in verse 9. 
because the preacher was wise, and so he still taught the people knowledge, yet he gave good heat and sought out and set in order many proverbs. And so Solomon's writings, he said, were upright. He said the words were words of what? Truth. He falls off to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. What's the importance of finding acceptable words? Acceptable. What are acceptable words? Words are, words are powerful. Boy, they are powerful. Words is what the Lord uses to get the gospel in the hearts of mankind. Quick and powerful. I read somewhere where they're sharper than any two-edged one. Piercing. Piercing. Yeah. Words of power. So Solomon gives words which are truth, words which are upright in the process there. And he's, he describes them as goads in verse 11, nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Talking about something as goads or nails fashioned, he's talking about what in the process there? Those things which. Do what? Hold for it. Holds things together. Here's what holds things together in the process there. And does so in a good way. And which are given by one shepherd. And we think we probably understand the one shepherd context of the Ecclesiastes of God. God. I think so. I said the Lord himself. So the conclusion of the whole matter is fear God. God is exalted by the words of Solomon which are accepted truth, power, and they exalt our God. Solomon's God, by the way, the best we can get, is our God. The same God in the process. Why? He's going to bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So there is an implication, there is a standard between good and evil, what constitutes good and what constitutes evil. All mankind, whatever else may happen here, quote, under the sun. Man may do it there. He needs to learn the basic foundational fundamental lesson that there is a God, and that God is one to whom all are accountable. And there is hope because there is God, and life is not that which is concluded just under the contents or the views as it might be seen by a man from under the sun that is set apart from God. But life is to be viewed with whom and whose sight. God with God in our sight, in our hearts, in our minds, in our actions, in our life, truth. Question, comment, you have about the book of Ecclesiastes. Go home and read it some more and you learn to appreciate it. Learn, learn to read and appreciate the language and the structure of it too, by the way. I think you'll be benefiting great if you haven't done so. Let's get out your handouts on the book of the Song of Solomon. I think I have everybody checked. I didn't see Hannah here tonight. Hannah's not present. Anyone else? Anyone else not present? Oh, yeah. Gotcha. We got you. And uh, Song of Solomon can be a challenging book, but can also be a very rewarding book. And, uh, yeah. and especially when it comes to the home, you've probably already read the Song of Solomon, and I'm sure the preparation for class, that you read the Song of Solomon, expresses in, uh, in no uncertain terms the wonderful relationship that there is between the man and the woman On your handout here, we're going to just briefly go over some of these. If you have your study questions, I'd like for us to at least get the first eight. These, these are matters which have to do with pertaining to the introduction, which uh, are not derived from the text like most of the others are. Or I said. The first thing you have there is the Song of Solomon. These first two pages of information I got from Brother Jackie Steersman. Back many years ago, Brother Steersman was, and may still be, the director of the Florida School of Preaching, a great Bible student. Brother Leland Rogers was having a class and he had taught by Brother Winfrey Clark. And uh, Brother Leland Rogers, I checked with Brother Steering and he said, it's all right to copy that. In fact, he had, we had 
He allowed us to make copies of every, he has them, of every book in the Bible. He said, we make copies of every one. This is just a portion of what he had on the book of the Song of Solomon. And uh, Solomon, of course, identified as a writer, 1 Kings 4, 32, 105 songs. This is a song of songs, and so we can consider this to be of a superlative nature. Theories of interpretation. We're not spending some time, but some of these matters I'm going to let you read on your own. But because of the nature of the language, poetic, or the poetical sex of the book, and because of the content of the book, there's been all sorts of uh, ideas and theories and concepts of what's meant by the wording of the language of the book. Here are some allegorical where Solomon is uh, allegorically represents uh, Jehovah God and and of course Christ is represented allegorically by the Shunammite uh, girl. The process we'll talk a little bit about for a moment. And a lot of problems with that and all the details and everything else, you start trying to make allegorical applications, those things you're going to find yourself in a quagmire from which you will not recover. The process. Literal, this perhaps should have been first or last of the thing. And this is simply regards to song as love song. First verse of the book says, verse 2, verses 1 and 2, the song of songs which is Solomon, and verse 2 says, let him kiss my mouth, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than mine. And so right away we learn what kind of song is this going to be. It's going to be a love song, is it? And it's going to be a love song in the most expressive way that we might be able to find in the process and so on. The idea, and so uh, here is a wonderful idea of the process. We, we uh, personally look at the words of Solomon, simply as words which represents literal events in the life of King Solomon and the Shunammite girl in the process. And so uh, various things which go through it. So uh, verse number 200 B says, the theory which maintains that the song is the God-approved expansion of wedding love. We certainly would not disagree with that at all in the process expresses the attraction of a husband and wife and describes it in a natural, non-pornographic manner. Contains a warning against all who would abuse true and genuine affection. It is an affirmation of the purity and the godliness of the scriptural relationship of man and wife, the husband and wife. So wonderful things to think about that. There's another view that we won't talk about, the pagan liturgy, or liturgy for me, we'll talk the next page there. And number D talks about it being a parable. It's not a great deal different than the allegorical method. And uh, so the song does celebrate dignity and purity of human love, but the eye of faith sees beyond this to the love of God to his chosen people. And we wouldn't take issue with that. Brother Roy Deaver also makes that comment statement somewhere. Here's one that's taken, uh, the reference is made to E.J. Young in the Old, Old Testament introduction, Lace, Lace and Archer in the survey of the Old Testament. And the purpose of the book, very quickly, number three, again, expressing the nature, the beauty, the blessings, and the constancy of married, 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 Personal purity, verse line number two, both before and during the marriage, emphatically and beautifully declares that there should be no inhibitions in married love. And we'll see in the language expressed in this Song of Solomon that that was the case between him and his bride. The word beloved occurs 32 times. Jews read it at what feast? Passover. Passover, remind them of the love of Jehovah for Israel. Uh, other Bible students have seen in this a symbol of Christ's love for the church. But the Deaver, a number of East, uh, states the truth when he says the Song of Solomon emphasizes the nature, beauty, and blessings of the married love as symbolic of the love of God. And it may be symbolic of it per se. I don't know where you would go to a specific verse that says this is the case. As such. Some have suggested verses like 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and Ephesians 5, 25, 27. Support that. What well, it does support you know, God's love for His people, as such, and Christ's love for the church, with the application there. So that gives you a general line. outline of the book. Here's another page I thought I would just add to your notes. In our handouts there, I 
try to develop our handouts on the basis that here's something that might be beneficial to you, not just today or tonight or next week, but sometime in the future when you may be going back and doing some study or maybe teaching in these particular areas, or you may have someone else who's looking for some help, and you'll be able to help them along the back way. Here's some information that's taken from the uh, an article written by Doug McLish in the 1994 Memphis School of Preaching and Lectureship. Under the Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, Curtis A. Cates is an editor at that time of that book. Two outlines here. One is by Brother Cates, and uh, we're going to emphasize this general outline in our study, but not just because it's here, but because it's our, our notes and such. Three progressive steps. Learn these as we look at them for the first time. Here. One, one through three and five. The courtship of the bridegroom and the bride to be. Courtship. What follows a courtship? Mm -hmm. There it's wedding. You got a wedding procession. The honeymoon, which results out of that, chapter 360, 5-1. And then in verse uh, 5, that first early part, it seemed like that there's some reason which causes separation. And so sometimes it's identified as marriage difficulty, and difficulty resolved, and growth of uh, marriage of this on through the end of the book. I have a comma after the first marriage that should not be there, so just take your point out there and get rid of it, okay? And the second outline is written by Brother Jim Laws, one of a kind, one of a kind Jim Laws. Brother Laws, great servant, good man, good teacher of God's Word. I had the privilege of sitting in his classes a few times and preached uh, for a long time, for several years out to Get Well Church of Christ, directed the spiritual sword lectureship, of which some of you received book of which is still produced by the church tonight in the book of Job. Five points that Brother Laws kind of, he, he, he uh, kind of expands the idea here. And uh, the bride and the king express their love for each other. One through two, seven. And uh, this should go through, uh, well it goes through two, seven. The inscription of the bride's description of the king, and so it's going to give a description of the king, one, one through eleven. The bride and the king meet. Well, number two, the bride prays for the king. She prays him rather eloquently. Prays for the king, prays for the king by day, and then the bride prays for the king by night. Number three talks about the king's cry should be praise, I think, for the bride. You can take into account who tried to type that. So praise would be the word I think you want to correct that to. Three, six, three, five, one. And the king arrives and uh, house accompanied by a great host of soldiers and he described the bride in terms of love and tenderness. He was a fellow who had the ability to use some rather uh, uh, effective words I guess might be one way to put it. Number four, the disturbing dream of the bride. Separation. The dream described and then the bride finds the king and he praises her for her beauty. And number five, the undying love and devotion of the king. Bride, chapter 17 through chapter 8. Gives her love to the king. The beauty of love is described. Good things to be thinking about. Mostly. On your expanded outline, you might get those. And go ahead and get your study questions before you so you can take a note or two on them. And we'll look at those things and then we'll be getting into the text of the book of Song of Solomon for just a bit, tonight anyway. While I'm thinking about you, I want you to read the text of this book between now and the last class at least three times. I think that's going to help us. Read it three times. But get accustomed to it. And don't, don't uh, read it, you know, put it together in your mind. See what the general overview of the plan of development of the text is in the process. Learn to look at the text and what's, what, this, what this statement says and then what's around it. What's being said and talked about. I think you'll be benefited greatly by having done that. All right, the Hebrew book is called the Song of Songs. Jerome, in the Latin, gave it the name of Canticles, C A N T I C L E S. Canticles. This which is another word for song, song. 
The simple theme of the book. Now you might word this in various ways as such, but I'm going to give you one expression. It's a little bit extensive, so uh, there, and if you want to reword it to your satisfaction, I'd feel free to do that. The Song of Song, we've already mentioned this in Brother Steers was note, emphasize the nature, beauty, and blessings of married love. Emphasizes the nature, beauty, and blessings of married love. Nature, beauty, and blessings of married love. That's the general overall thesis, I think, of this good book. Now, in addition to that, in a symbolic sense, in respect of Brother Deaver and others who have looked at it, and I have no reason to say to throw it out, it also is symbolic of the love of God, the Old Testament Israel, and the love of Christ for his church. That's it. And since a number of our brethren look at it, that good solid brethren, good, good, good brethren. So I would, and sometimes I put some things in our notes that uh, I may not personally fully agree with such, but the information comes from sources of such good nature that I think you as a class you have a right and the ability to look at it and make evaluations to those things yourself. So try to do that. Love between a man and his wife, which could not be extinguished, could not be replaced by riches of wealth. Chapter 8, let's just go, you know, we started out in the book of Ecclesiastes, really, by looking at the last two verses of the book. Let's go to the end of this book and take a look at verse 2 also. Chapter 8. And uh, 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. Why? For love is strong as... Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? Love is strong as death. And be thou faithful unto death. Jealousy is cruel as the... The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Verse 7 says, Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, he would utterly be condemned. When you read the book of Song of Solomon, we're going to find out the nature of Find out the nature and the beauty and the blessings of married love. Come there. Number four, according to chapter one, verse one, the ark of the book is. Oh. If you don't accept the inspiration of the Bible, you can go and you can read about various other theories about who might or might not have been the ark of the book of Solomon. But since the book of Song of Solomon is a is correctly and properly and never really been successfully challenged as belonging to the canon. What in the world is that? What are you Those considered inspired. Yeah, the books of the Bible, because these are all books which are considered and deemed to be inspired of God. They are divine writers, if you will, in the process. There have been adequately and uh, evidentially set forth as that. Here are some of the key verses, number five, you might want to write in there. And we'll just look through these very quickly for the purpose of our reading. Because once we get the idea of the book and get through, we get into reading it there, all these things help us get, you know, to get the flow of the flavor of it. That might be one of them. Chapter two and verse four, it's one. He brought me to the bank in the house and his banner over me was love. Well, we've heard that before, haven't we? And we can see why some might look at this as a parabolic or allegorical of Christ and the church and such. We will find expressions like this. And, uh, what about verse uh, 16 on down to chapter 16? My beloved is mine and I am he 
his. Chapter 6, verse 3. These are not all, but these are some which have a similar theme. Verse 3 of chapter 6, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. And back in chapter 2 of 16, he's to be still being among the ladies. But I hope it's there you go. Chapter 7, verse 10, I am my beloved's, and his desire is to me. So I think those are some of the key thoughts here. You're talking about this relationship between the bride and the bridegroom, which are set forth in this book. And uh, they are each other's. They belong to each other and to no other. And so that's the nature of it. Number six, you've already answered, what was read publicly among the Jews on what day? Passover. Number seven, the cast of the character of the book. I have the blank for five here. Three really are significant because they have the, uh, I guess we might say the speaking part. Solomon, of course, is asked the first of the royal king and bridegroom. Then there's one in there who is, uh, is described as a very beautiful young bride from northern Israel, and she would be the Shulamite. S-H-U-L-A-M-I-T-E. Sometimes people spell it Shulamith. I-T-H on it. Shulamite. You mean like if somebody else who had a Shulamite? Mm -hmm. Who was that? Mm -hmm. David did, did Abishag, was that her name, Brother Butcher? Abishag was a Shulamite. I don't think this is Abishag because that other one was the one who kept, was kept David Comfort. This may be a daughter, but no, you can't say that. You can't say that. But anyway, process. And then, of course, the daughter of the bridegroom's corpse or attendants there, sometimes described as the daughters of Jerusalem. They're her handmaids, her maiden, her corpse, those who are, they serve her personally, seems to be the idea. And uh, then also, there are those who are, just, chapter 8 mentioned, are her brothers in the plural. Most people think they likely could be half brothers. And then there's one little sister mentioned there also. Although they don't speak, they are characters and the thing there. And there are others, one or two others there. But primarily, the Solomon, the Shulamite girl, woman, and the daughters of Jerusalem, when it comes to the speaking context of the book of Song of Solomon, they're the uh, ones who do the talking and uh, the process. That being the case, let's look at chapter four. number eight there. talks about the, four, the uh, up among the interpretations. We touched upon those, but just so you can put them in your notes there if you'd like to. Well, that which identifies Solomon and Jehovah, the Shulamite, as Israel, as Israel or the church, that would be the allegorical method. Some people like they got it. That which describes God approved expressions of wedded love, that would be what we have talked about as being the literal approach to it. Originally sung as a liturgy of the pagan deacon, uh, deacons, deacons, excuse me, deacons, I didn't mean to bring up one point. But adapted to be in harmony with the religion of Israel, that would be the pagan liturgy. And then there's that which maintains the song, celebrates the dignity and the purity of human love. It sees beyond this the love of God for his chosen people, that's the parable. So there's a fifth sometimes people call it. Maybe they call it the dialectic method, or it might be the didactic method. Maybe the didactic method. Or didactic means teaching. So it does have, the song has some great teaching, and no question about that. But it also has some realism. Realism. All right, let's look. The next uh, 10 minutes or less, whatever we'll have, in the first chapter or so of the book. Song of Solomon. And so again, for verse 2. We find the bride, verses 2 through 7, if you'll follow your notes there. The bride, the Shulamite, speaks, so the bride reflects her deep longing for her beloved. And uh, we get the flavor of the language right up front as we go. So let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine, because the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. 
And then she says, and uh, then so she speaks of love for the king there. And so, what about this idea that thy name is as ornament poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee? The idea of ornament poured forth, that simply speaks of what? Something that's very pleasant. Very pleasant. Good to hear. You reckon there was a lot of the uh, lady folks in the country around who kind of looked at the autumn with eyes of favor and Jordan and just like to hear his name. That doesn't doesn't mean that there's immoral involvement in per se in there. Yeah. He certainly would be one who had the very center of attention in the country at that time. And uh, so when she says we, plural, in the verse four, we will run after thee, the king hath brought me and brought me in his chamber. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. Who do you think she's speaking of there? And I ask you first on that, so you'll have to tell me. Who do you think, Peter? We're not far and said, I'm just just a thought. Now this is just my thought. She speaks of what she had a court who was with her. At least had and uh, there's her maidens if you such. And there, so that may be the case. Then she used rather uh, verses five through six and seven. She speaks for herself, she says, I am black, but comely, oh, you daughters of Jerusalem, as a tent of Kedar, and uh, there, and uh, she describes herself as a tent of Kedar, as a curtain of Solomon, look not upon me because I am black. Why is she black, according to verse 6? So sad. Yeah, son, that looked upon me, and she says, my mother's children were angry with me, they made me to do what? And so there are these brothers, I guess, we would interject into that thing. This, this Shunammite woman, did she, she, was she at home over there behind? What was she doing during the daytime? Working. She was out in the field working where she was. And she was put out there by the family. My own vineyard, she says, hey, well, I've been out here keeping the vineyard, the family vineyard, day, but my own vineyard, I haven't kept. What's her own vineyard? Yeah, face or complexion or her personal appearance, and uh, evidently she didn't need a lot of help for that personal appearance because when Solomon describes her, she's uh, described as a very beautiful person. And uh, the word black also is a very interesting word there. I had some notes on it, but I don't know what I did with it in the uh, process there. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, had a very special, it comes from a word which uh, has to do with the concept of, uh, you know, dark and that sort of thing. Not like we would use it, not the not the word that we would ordinarily use for the word black. And so tents, she's like tents of keto. Wow. What's on the curtains of song? Which simply means what? Mm -hmm. Tents of Kedar, tents of the Arabians, made out of goat skins, curtains of Solomon, lavish splendor Solomon's house. And so she doesn't she doesn't really present herself as extraordinarily extraordinary, does she? She says, I'm, uh, she feels that way in the process. So, verse, verse 7, she has a desire. Her desire is to do one thing. She says, tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, whom thou feedest, where, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. But why should I be as one that turneth aside by the, be turned aside by the flocks of thy companions. She had a desire to know where the one that she loves was located at this particular time. She didn't want to go out among the various fields and various flocks and say, was he here, is he here? But he said, here, there, and yonder, Lord Abel. And so I was to know where it would be. And uh, the son had looked upon me and crossed his Let's look quickly, if you will, on down verses 9 through 11. Here's Saul is going to praise her beauty. You talk about a fellow having a way with words. And uh, he says, Thou know not, O thou fairest among young women, go thy way forth for thy footsteps, uh, by the footsteps of the flock, and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses. <laughs> Married for a and large, so that might be the case. It's a, in Pharaoh's chariots or horses. You're just as beautiful as 
Well, you get, uh, you know, you can see the image there. You get the mayor and a great company of horses and this, that. She's going to have some attention. Yeah, she's going to be noted in the process. Thy cheeks are coming with rose uh, jewels, thy neck with chains of gold, which probably has to do with some idea of, you know, the ornaments of uh, jewelry and that sort of thing, we would think. And uh, they're in the process. be as one of the turn aside by the fox. Let's we uh, miss verse eight. Let's go back to verse eight. It seemed like the court attendant here is the one who speaks here. And when he when he asked about where he was, he found Norse, uh, if thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth thy footsteps and flock feet thy kids from beside the shepherd man. So it seemed like that would be a speaker there. And then Solomon goes back and makes that comparison. And he says, you know, we'll make the borders of gold with studs of silver. He says, you know, right now, you know, the, the general appearance of her is given as such. And, uh, and uh, uh, cheeks. Saw him take notice of cheeks. Yeah. Neck. Yeah. Be some more about that. And he said, you know, we'll provide you with all that other gold and silver stuff that you could ever need in the process. Well, Verse uh, 12 seems to be the bride, once again, speaking. Now she's going to praise the king. Let's see how she does that through the end of this chapter. While the king sitteth at his table, my, the bride's, spiker, sendeth forth the smell thereof. The bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. And we said earlier, the language here is not lacking any descriptive aspects at all in the process of what about the idea of smite spiker and myrrh? We might use a general word for that as well. Very aromatic. Yeah, very aromatic. Perfume. Uh, Perfumatic. Makes your what? Smell good. Women still do that same yeah women still try to do the women the men still appreciate it. Yeah, the men still appreciate it. The process. And uh, her desire was to be with him in the process. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Ingida. Well, cluster of camphor, if you notice in your hand down there, has the word henna or flowers according to the American Standard Version. That's just simply a fragrant bush, something that's very fragrant and pleasant. And uh, she continues on, it says, Behold, and uh, thou art my fair. Thou art fair, my love, behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove, my dove's eyes. And pleasant also is our bed, also our bed is green, the beans of our house are cedar, and furs a tree process there. And uh, uh, Saul, obviously, is the one who is speaking here. It says, uh, the Shulamite woman, she has doves of eyes, has eyes, doves eyes. Well, as Jeremy thought, you know, innocent, meek, loving, eyes. Eyes are always one of the most significant, uh, attractive points of the lady. And her reply is uh, in the process and uh, says, Our bed is green. And the idea would simply seem to me probably referring to a green or natural bed of grass and flowers where they might sit or walk in the process. So we see the desire that they have one for another. Solomon speaks in verse 17 when he talks about the beams and house of cedar. And perhaps her bed of green is where they, you know, where they sat. The place was covered over with tall cedar trees, interwoven with a tree of various kinds and cedar trees. Wonderful. All right, we're going to cease and desist there for tonight. Next week, after you have read through that, I hope we get on through verse 7. I don't think we have time to do that. But chapter 2. Uh, next week we pick up in chapter 2, and if you go ahead and use your notes, I think we've tried to identify in your notes the process the speaker, because sometimes it's difficult to pinpoint who's speaking in this subject. So if we get that, that helps in the process of what we want through. Question, comment? All right. Describes the nature, the blessings, Beauty of the pure, married, love. We're
just that's how a prayer dismissal people would pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word and for the great encouragement you give us in this life. The beautiful pictures which you draw for us in your word, teaching us and directing us, helping us to understand our nature and our relationship to one another, especially when it comes to a wonderful relationship of marriage as you have designed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.